globalization over the years and what that means in the contemporary moment. And so that is, that is what I want to try to entangle a little bit here. Um, in fairness to the topic and in fairness to our people, um, this is just merely a scratching of the surface, a glimpse, um, a moment that we can kind of stimulate some ideas and at the end of the evening, I'm really interested in hearing your feedback. I'm hoping that this will lead to a, um, you know, yet another paper to write, et cetera, on this topic. So that's, that's kind of my overview of my thinking on the topic. Um, log back on here. So, to outline what I wanted to cover tonight, and, and much of it was actually covered um, eloquently by Dr. Underwood, um, is I want to kind of let you know where I'm coming from on a personal level. Um, so I'm going to, you know, the academic word for that is autoethnographic context. Um, secondly, I want to go over some demographics that uh, Faye Antala not too long ago went over on this campus. Um, and then I want to spend more time with some of the uh, theoretical ideas that will help us entangle and make sense of this comp complex phenomenon. Um, and in doing that, we'll look at some of the historical contexts of tomorrow migration. And then we'll look at some of the more contemporary dynamics of Chamorro diaspora. And more specifically, what I'm interested in um, hearing you know, your thoughts on is uh, educational diaspora, particularly in higher education, OK? Now, myself as a diasporic Chamorro, um, my story is very familiar, very, very uh, common among many of you. Um, my father joined the military, you know, straight out of high school. Um, you know, went to the recruitment uh, center and joined the army. Uh, my mother also um, left with her eldest sister, who's in the audience, um, and went to Southern California, Long Beach area. And at some point down the road, that's where my parents met. And they had, you know, I was born, first born, etc. So, as with many of your relatives, we found ourselves located in this, you know, kind of uh, foreign place um, in Long Beach, California, where a lot of Chamorros found themselves located in. So as a diaspora at Chamorro, um, our lives connected to the island were captured in memories, in um, information and artifacts sent from the island, in communication both ways, et cetera, through the years. And then, of course, for funerals and weddings, um, we, we traveled to and from Guam, you know, through the years. And my cousins, um, you know, came, came to the States as well. And so, you know, that's, that kind of captures this transnational mobility of a people. And again, I want to reiterate that it's not only physical, a one-way street or a two-way street, but it's symbolic, it's cultural, and it's multiple routes. Um, growing up in the States, um, the most salient experience I think that I was encountered with and I learned a lot from my from my dad was being perceived and being dealt with, so to speak, as a minority on the mainland. You know, his experience um, was, you know, during the 60s and so he was coming of age during a time in which uh, racism in the South was still very entrenched. And so being a military officer, as many of you shared experience, a segregation, you know, Jim Crow was live and well um, in a de facto way, but the consequences were, were very vivid and real, okay? Um, so he came of age during this time, and then I came of age um, during another time in which um, racial logic and racial identity took on a new life, but no less salient and no less um, consequential. And so I, you know, I kind of came of age um, you know, during like the early hip hop um, house party kind of kinds of uh, cultural movements, um, in which you know minority groups were were articulating and expressing themselves through through a beat and through a rhythm that was uh, was uh, constructed at a local level and it had the sense of of urban authenticity. And then over the years, you know, you see the popularity of hip hop on the island for quite some time now. Um, there's different versions of hip hop. There's different versions of reggae music, and different diasporic groups have kind of appropriated hip hop 
and appropriated music more generally to express their own experiences. And so this again is not a, a new phenomenon. It's, um, it's, it's simply part of a series of different appropriations of music, of politics, of culture, etc. cetera. Um, so as a minority, quote unquote minority on the US mainland, when you're a member of a group who is small in number, yet has a Spanish surname, and racially, quote unquote racially, kind of um, appears to be members of more larger recognizable groups, there is the contradiction of being a highly visible, invisible minority. And it is from through that lens that uh, has helped, helped uh, many of us uh, try to make sense of who we are in terms of our ambivalence on the U.S. mainland in connection to our ancestral homeland. So that is the kind of the personal foundation that stimulated my academic ideas to pursue um, a broader and deeper understanding of myself and the sociological and cultural things at play. Now, some of the, you know, very briefly, some of the uh, theoretical uh, underpinnings of my of my work and um, implicit in the presentation tonight um, is related to um, colonial and post-colonial theory. Um, you know, this is kind of the sociology 101 part of the presentation for Dr. Johnson's students back there. You guys take notes because I'm I'm sure I'm going to write a question for your next exam. So this is the part. Um, colonial theory uh, really captures the. Um, the conditions of colonization. Here on Guam, the, the primary condition, I think, has to do with uh, the cultural erosion of Chamorro culture as a result of subsequent stages and ways of colonization, and of course, the, the ambiguity in our political status as a result of a colonial history. Uh, Post-colonial theory is more about the transcendence of those conditions and the transcendence of identities that have been imposed on colonized people. So part of the problem of colonization is not simply the politics and the hegemony, the cultural hegemony of, of um, colonization, but it also has to do with a history of colonizers, a history of people outside of your group having a monopoly on defining who you are. So the Chamorro story is part of the story of indigenous people. It's a case in point of the story of indigenous people who not only struggle politically, economically, socially, culturally, but struggle to have voice in simply answering the question of who I am in their own voice. And for those kinds of stories to resonate um, rather than being told who you are from the outside. And that is part of the colonial uh, foundation of uh, indigenous people in general. Um, and so this term rearticulations is a, you know one of these college academic words that simply means when a group of people who have historically been disadvantaged at some point muster up the courage and the resilience to not only define themselves but to empower themselves by appropriating colonial institutions to then define themselves and be listened to and that that is captured in the term rearticulation and then finally as a result of these, these broader historical things at play, um, there's you know, very, very recent academic developments in Native, and, Native American and Indigenous studies. And in partly related to that, there is an emergence of what is referred to as uh, Native Pacific studies that um, uh, Vince Diaz and Kehelani Kawanui um, kind of coined in uh, their publication uh, in the Contemporary Pacific, where they were guest editors and compiled together uh, a number of works from different Pacific Islanders and kind of coined this term. And so, you know, now we're at a point about nine, ten years later since the initial coining of that term in which you have a real field that, that spans a number of universities and colleges and spans a number of uh, academic disciplines. And then finally, dia uh, diaspora studies is another kind of hot topic in, in the academic world, uh, things that students are studying. And, you know, this, this topic runs the risk of, um, you know, it's been described as being like the, the latest trend in academia. And Paul Spickard, who published, um, was at, uh, one of the editors of, of Pacific Diaspora, cautions us that uh, to not get kind of consumed and absorbed into the 
the trendiness of academic discourse 